Um, hello, everyone, and welcome, and thanks for coming um, to tonight's talk for, we're with Paul Mason. It's a, essentially a book launch for his new book. Um, I'm not quite sure where Paul's just gone, but I, I trust that he'll be back in a minute. Um, I'm Simon from Five Leaves Bookshop. Um, I will be in the chat. I'll be posting links to buy the book if you've not got it already yet. And I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you've got any questions for Paul or David, um, put them in the Q&A along the bottom so that it's easy to find because things get lost in the chat quite a bit. Um, other than that, I think if you've got any questions or problems, do just hit me in the chat and uh, I'll sort it out. So I'll hand over to David Renton, who's a barrister and a, and a historian of the far right, um, and I'll leave him to do the rest of the introductions. Thanks. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Simon. And first of all, can I just welcome everyone um, who's come today. I've seen from the chat, we have people from Leicestershire, Solihull, Wiltshire, um, Sheffield, um, and of course, lots of people from Nottingham. Um, I'm delighted that you've all been, been able to make it. We're here to discuss Paul Mason's new book, um, How to Stop Fascism. I'm very happy that, to say that I've been sent a copy of the book in advance, um, and I hope that by the end of this evening, um, lots of you have ordered copies too. Uh, this is an event hosted by Five Leaves Bookshop, Nottingham's independent bookstore, um, my name's Dave Renton and I'll be chairing. If you need to send me a direct message, it should be pretty obvious. If you just look in the chat function, you can do that. I'm marked as David Renton Chair. Um, now to introduce Paul. Um, Paul was previously the business editor at Newsnight and then the economics editor at Channel 4. Um, he famously resigned from that post so that he could contribute to public discussions through events such as this. How to Stop Fascism is his seventh book. How, how we um, thought we'd um, do tonight is if Paul spoke at the start for about 15 minutes, I'll then ask him questions, which I've already got in advance, we're again about another 15 minutes. What I'll then be doing is I'll try and go over to questions which I've been sent through the chat function, I'll ask them directly to him. So please keep an eye on, on the chat or the Q&A if you want to ask questions there, which I'll then read out and ask to Paul. So frankly, without any further delay, over to you, Paul. Um, can you describe the contents of the book? Thank you, David. Can everybody see me? Yes. Good. Right. Well, uh, thank you for coming, everybody. And um, I'm sorry we're not all together in Nottingham. I used to live in Leicester for about six years in the 80s and uh, uh, was very often politically active in Nottingham and even more often down the pub in Nottingham. So I miss it a lot. Um, and thank you to Five Leaves. Well, in this introduction, all I can do is give an overview of the book, but let me just first of all st start by, um, by just saying why I've written it. Because why do we need another book about fascism? You know, I mean, our children study fascism, you know, from the year dot at school, and, and we know we're, we're sick of seeing, I personally am sick of seeing imagery of fascism in popular culture, in drama. It's an easy thing, you know, let's do another movie about Hitler, whatever. Um, so I was in uh, London on one of the Remain demos during the prorogation crisis in uh, September uh, 2019. And um, there was the usual, the Tommy Robinson people came up to me and started yelling at me and yelling at us indeed and, and in fact disrupted our meeting. But it was one of the first times that I've had a fascist start talking to me about Marxism. In fact, they weren't talking to me. They were shouting into my camera, Paul Mason, Marxist traitor to our country we've researched you and I thought well you know something's changed here because when I was in the ANL and I was in also in youth against racism in Europe and I was also briefly a participant in uh, anti-fascist action you know when you were just occasionally undercover so you you know you went you were in Brick Lane and your job was to be among them as a white person you can do that and listen to them and see what they're doing these were not crazy people. They were unpleasant, racist, you know, self-identified fascists. But that what, what was interesting about them was that they were rational. They had a rational kind of core to their ideas. Um, many of them were like what I call organic fascists in the sense that it was about place and face. It was about coming from a part of East London. Their dad had been in the Chelsea Headhunters. Their granddad had probably been a Mosleyite. The pub they drank in had probably been right wing with a Confederate flag on the wall since the 30s, you know, something like that. Today, we are dealing with something quite different. And those of us who've seen both iterations, and David is one of them, uh, and I'd be really interested to see how our views intersect. Um, 
If you've seen both iterations, we're now dealing with something different and I think more serious, more of a threat than what we were dealing with with the NF and the BMP. We can go through the history of what we did with them, to them, and what it did to them. But in the writing of this book and in the promotion of it, what, one of the things I've come up against, it, for example, you know, literary editors of, of big newspapers that don't like the book, um, is what's the problem, Paul? You know, Trump's gone. Uh, he's over, he's finished. And anyway, he wasn't a fascist. The AFD, they're on 11% in Germany, and they're not fascist and they can't win. And Marine Le Pen, okay, she might get into the second round, probably will get into the second round of the French election in next April, but she won't win. And anyway, she's not a fascist. She's stepped away from fascism. And Tommy Robinson, fair enough, he had a million followers. And yeah, Cre Cadbury's Cream Egg only has 2 million, so that's quite a lot of followers on Facebook. But he's bankrupt and he's nowhere. So what's the problem? The problem for me starts from the realisation that a second fascist era is possible. That's, the, that's what the problem is. I think I was born into a world in 1960 in which most historians, most politicians did not believe a second fascist era was possible. One bloke did, Maurice Bardèche, and I quote him in the book, um, the French neo-fascist, he was a collaborator in the Second World War, he said in 1961, at another time, in another place, with the face of a child we do not recognise, the order of Sparta will be reborn, i.e. fascism. And Bardesh said, look, it wasn't swastikas or concentration camps or torture cells that, that characterised fascism, it was its concept of man and freedom. I think today... If you, you, know, you are only two or three clicks away from the fascist concept of man and freedom, that is, of the world, of inhumanism, anti-humanism and unfreedom. It's there. It's out there. If you think a second fascist era is possible, for those of you who know the historiography of fascism, that is, how it was that historians started to write the history of it, because nobody wanted to until about 1961, 62. How they began, the, the premise they began from was it's a dead phenomenon. It's perfect for a historian. It's like the it's like the Byzantine Empire. It's gone. We'll never see another one. So we can basically study it as a finished object. It, it, once you realise we're not dealing with that anymore, and we're not in that particular Kansas anymore, it is a big mind bender. Because in business and in economics, when we, when we assess risk, we think about risk equals the likelihood of something happening times its impact. So if the risk of fascism happening again is zero, who cares what its impact would be if it came back? That's a, a matter for science fiction. But if you do think it's possible that it could come back, and indeed that the likelihood is rising for reasons I'll go into, let's face it, the impact will be massive. I write in the book about going to Maidanek, which was one of the smaller death camps, concentration camps, in, uh, involved in Operation Reinhardt, the liquidation of Jews in Poland in the Second World War. Maidanek was like, you know, little concrete posts, you know, uh, flimsy pine huts, barbed wire, yeah, barbed wire, electrified barbed wire. But 500 people escaped. In fact, in the last few months of that concentration camp's existence, the Nazis shot 15,000 people, mainly Jews, in ditches because they feared a mass escape and indeed an uprising. In a modern Maidanek, nobody would escape. There would be no uprising. It would be like Guantanamo, only as I say in the book, with a gift shop. You know, uh, it, would be, it would be inescapable, inhuman, and totally dominant. So if we are running the risk of a more likely fascism and a massively more impactful result if that were to take place, we have to say the risk has increased and it is tangible. From where does the risk arise? This is almost one of the kind of key tenets of the book, so I will kind of dwell on it a bit. Since the 1990s, many of us in politics have been observing the rise of what we call right-wing populism. So Farage and UKIP, remember it was Kilroy Silk first, then Farage, um, Marine Le Pen moving in the direction of constitutional politics, uh, 
away from the French fascism, from where the Rassemblement National, used to be called the Front National, existed. Uh, the AFD in Germany, rising in general in response to the huge migrant influx in 2015, uh, no one 11%. Um, we've been seeing Trump, so you take Trump, Bolsonaro, Modi in India, Orban in Hungary, Erdogan in Turkey. They didn't all start off even as right-wing populists. Some started off as just Democrats. But right-wing populism has been the defining thing that's changed official politics. And it's changed it everywhere. And this is what political scientists are obs obsessed with. And like the first tenet that you have to learn in political science is that right-wing populism is not fascism. And that is correct. Uh, you know, the European Union website has a, actually a handbook on how to stop spot the difference and it says right-wing populists work through parliament they work through elections they don't like democracy but they, they accept it exists they're not violent and their their racism is kind of a cultural racism fascists on the other hand hate democracy are violent will overthrow democracy exist in small militarized groups don't stand mainly in elections and um and their modus operandi is very similar to to the, the historic fascism okay the, the kind of paul mason how to stop fascism 101 is this that we saw the emergence of those right-wing populist parties as a threat to liberal democracy and indeed to us the left but we didn't see them as an accelerator of fascism we saw them in fact as a firewall against fascism. And indeed, there are many political scientists who've built their careers on the idea that no matter how unpleasant the average UKIP supporter is, that, that UKIP stops them becoming fascist. It's a kind of firewall against radicalization. Well, hello. The problem is, since about 2015, that's not the case. It, pro it probably was the case before, but it's not anymore. What's happening is that from Trump to Bolsonaro to Modi in India onwards, and I would argue also Johnson here, right-wing populist governments are becoming the accelerators of actual fascism for a reason we'll come to. And the firewall is not a firewall at all. It's on fire. It's an accelerator of the thing it's trying to retard. Now, what has happened and what I think happened I saw it quite clearly on that demo again, where I went undercover on it outside Parliament, where they were, where the Democratic Football Lads Alliance were defending Winston Churchill's statue. Um, if you talk to Hope Not Hate, the anti-fascist monitoring group, they're very insistent that the DFLA are not a fascist group. They're a right, they're a radical right-wing group, but but they're not a fascist group. Okay, let's accept that. They're pretty obnoxious, but they're not fascist. The problem is their thought architecture, their mindset, their logic has completely molded itself on the new logic of fascism. And this it's important that we get our heads around what this new logic or thought architecture, as I call it in the book, consists of. In the book, I, I, I reduce modern fascist ideology to five propositions, and I'll go through them really quickly. First of all, the Great Replacement Theory, put forward by a bloke called Renard Camus, French writer, in, in the 2012. And, but it's got many, many antecedents in fascism itself. Great Replacement Theory says that migration is a form of genocide against white people because it's going to dilute our gene pool. Um, number, that's point one. White genocide, if you hear anybody talking about white genocide, you are talking to a fascist. OK, point two is that the the collaborators for this occupation. So Camus calls it the occupation of Europe by Muslims and refugees. The collaborators, very important. Number one collaborator, who, does, who do they hate? Feminists, because feminists depress the birth rate and demand women's reproduction, reproductive rights. Also in the collaborators uh, camp are human rights lawyers liberals, anybody with a universalist view of, of, of humanity. Point three is that all these feminists, liberals and human rights lawyers are in fact closet Marxists. And the reason for that is that Marxism, since her, uh, since uh, 
Cam since um, Marcuse in the in the 1960s. Marxism, they say, say the fascists, has taken a turn to culture. So cultural Marxism is a plot to destroy the West by promoting feminism, gay rights, transgender rights, black uh, and, and refugee equality. Point four is, what do we do about it? We're not seizing power just yet. We're spreading the message. We spread the message through demonstrative actions. We take action in, to tell the story over and over again. Point five is, why are we not so worried about taking power right now? Because in the future, whether it's the mid-distance or for some of them quite soon, there'll be a catastrophic event, sometimes called Day X, the storm, the catastrophe, whatever, where Western society ends in a global ethnic civil war, out of which there emerge continental scale, monocultural, ethnically pure states. Right? That is modern fascism. It's underpinning. Now, not all fascists get to this. It's almost like A-level fascism. This is not GCSE. A-level fascism is that we're also against modernity in its entirety. Everything that's happened since the French Revolution should be cancelled, according to them. Now, once you understand that, great replacement, anti-feminism, anti-modernism, ca catastrophic civil war in which the world ends and purity emerges, you can understand why the American far right this week, spontaneously, from numerous sources, is cheering the Taliban victory in Afghanistan. For them, the Afghan Taliban believe what they believe, anti-feminism, anti-modernity, show that it's possible to overthrow the American gay government, as the far right call it, and hasten the onset of this global international civil war in which the fascists win. So that is very briefly what fascism how fascists think. And my assertion in the book and what I try to show is that if you now speak to people involved in UKIP or the AFD or Vox in Spain, which has 3 million voters, AFD has 5 million voters, you will find again and again this way of thinking, which has nothing to do actually with the way Trump or Farage think. Trump and Farage are not theorists. The fascist theory has basically permeated right-wing politics. Even to the point where you get Suella Braverman and, and, and other Tory MPs banging on about cultural Marxism. Even to the point where, and li listen to this, you say, well, far-right people in America hail the Taliban victory over America. How terrible. British Tories were saying they'd rather England lose than win by taking the knee in the Euro 2020. The same tropes can be found at a more kind of diluted level throughout the right. A quick run through now about what's different. Okay, many of you, I hope, know a bit about historic fascism. In my book, there's three chapters about the history of it. Uh, and in each of them, I've tried to ask a question that professional historians and academic historians don't ask for good reason. How could it have been stopped? At what point in this particular process would it have been possible to stop it? Okay, but what is different between today's fascism and, and, and the fascism of the interwar period. I, I could identify four major things. First of all, and this is like one of the most famous definitions of fascism in academia, is by a, bloke called, uh, a professor called Rob, Roger Griffin, and he calls it palingenic ultranationalism. That, is, that means ultranationalism concerned with the rebirth of the nation, violent rebirth. Okay, that's probably true for somebody like Golden Dawn a group like Golden Dawn in Greece. But in general, for, glo for global modern fascism, it's not ultra-nationalism, but ethno-nationalism. That is, in Europe, they're quite, they're, they're, they're thinking about it at the scale of the white race. Likewise in America. You'll even find in the Pro Boys in the United States that you won't find many black people, the odd crazy black member of the Pro Boys exists. We find quite a few Hispanics, white passing Hispanics, because what they want is ethno nationalism rather than national nationalism. The second thing is, and I think it's really important to get our heads around this, that the route into fascism, when I was in my 20s, when, you know, when, when David's writing the first uh, version of his book, and also for, for most anti fascists in labor movement history, the route in is racism. They don't like Jews in the 30s, they don't like 
um, colonial subjects, black people in the 30s. Today, they don't like migrants. They don't like like uh, is like Islam or Muslims. But while Mussolini and Hitler were horrible, sexist misogynists, they did not have to face a female workforce and indeed population that was substantially empowered with human rights and reproductive rights. So the second big difference is that today, anti-feminism, I would say, is on a par with racism in, in fascist ideology. It's really important to them. Uh, and if you look at, even when they're using pseudoscience, the, the racist pseudoscience, you've all come across the bell curve, you know, the kind of in the 90s, the idea that black people are, are uh, by genetic de definition, less intelligent. OK, but equally important to them is that women are, are by genetic definition, subservient and and perform the behaviours that we associate with women, say, in the 19th century, you know, cooking the food, rearing the babies, obeying the husband, not owning property. So point two is anti-feminism is a key component of fascism. And why is that a problem? Because it's a massive route in to fascism among young men whose gender identity is called into question by the reality around them. Now, their gender identity tells them to be silent, macho and strong. Reality tells them that women are going to be their boss. What, what the hell? You know, uh, and women actually not just going to be their boss, the women are going to set the terms of sexual relationships and personal relationships. Um, point three, fascism is international in its modus operandi. So, you know, even as late as, say, the 2000s, I, I went to Hungary and interviewed Jobbik. Jobbik's this horrible fascist group, uh, and they are overtly fascist anti-Semites uh, in Hungary, and they had, they had MPs, and I interviewed them. And I said, um, so, so you're a Hungarian you know, far-right person. Um, what links do you have, say, with Bulgarian far-right people? And they said, no, we hate them, because... They said, you know, that they've got claims on our country. And indeed, they said, I said, well, what about the BMP? They said, yeah, but the BMP are um, anti-Muslim. We're not anti-Muslim. We just hate Jews. And this is a kind of this is a kind of old nationalism at the center of old fascism made it quite difficult for them to form international links. Today, they are internationalist by default. I would argue they are much more effectively internationalist, both in terms of money, collaboration, single message use of social media, uh, synergy between use of, uh, individual groups' use of social media, much more internationalist than the so-called internationalist left. That, you know, Mélenchon in France will not sit in the same room as Alexis Tsipras of Syriza. Um, but Steve Bannon has no, no problem travelling to Russia to meet this crazy guy, Alexander Dugin, who advocates, effectively, the defeat of America in global politics. Finally, What's different? And I've alluded to it. I think one of the most important things we need to understand about the modern far right is its use of what I call performative self-deception. The idea, and you see it on this weekend's anti-vax demos, that I am deluding myself. I believe that, you know, uh, COVID is a hoax spread by Bill Gates, you know, that he's injecting, five, he's, uh, injecting chips into our veins. People revel in a quasi-religious way in this in this collective self-deception self detect, <coughs> excuse me in a way that was not observable among the BMP and the NF and the and, and all the other groups in the 70s nor I would argue was it massively observable although we we didn't have these concepts in in the 30s what was observable in the 30s was the quasi-religious way in which people adopted fascism. And I think what we're seeing when, when we see anti-vaxxers and QAnon uh, conspiracy theorists drawn into the vortex of the modern far right, the thing that links them all is this refusal to believe scientific and rational um, truths. In that, indeed, their, com their conviction that truth doesn't exist. What do we do about it? To finish, in the book, you know, I, I, it's a no-brainer, actually, if you look at the history of fascism. It was only defeated organically, i.e. not by tanks uh, and, uh, and kind of, uh, you know, an invasion. 
by Russia and America. It was only in, defeated in places that did the following things. First of all, the acute threat of fascism in Spain in 1936 and France in 1934 to 36 was defeated by the communists uh, ceasing the ridiculous position of saying that socialists were the same as fascists and switching to a position that said, let the communists, socialists, and indeed liberals join a popular front to defend democracy. Now, the first thing you learn on, in the British left is that this was a disaster. And indeed, it came to a sad end. You know, the Spanish Civil War was defeated, the, the Republican side were defeated and indeed turned on their own working class under the uh, influence of Moscow communism. That's true. Uh, it's also true that the French Popular Front, while it did you know, inaugurate the most left-wing government ever in the history of France, only lasted about, you know, less than 12 months and before it started back backtracking and um, and fought, and the liberals and the socialists started to fall apart and the communists, you know, they weren't even in the government, they but they massively supported it. They too kind of sold out strikes. Okay, so let's accept the Popular Front ended in failure, but what it, what, what it succeeded in was something. It defended democracy. Um, and I think we could at least start a discussion about how we might do that, because the popular fronts were above all electoral alliances. They said and they understood that the way to power for, for Spanish fascism, Spanish fascism was small, but Spanish fascism was going to rule alongside clerical, far right, right wing populist politics. No, known, well, one key part of it was Franco's phalangism, the phalange uh, party. Now, the, the Spanish left said, well, there's only one way to stop them. So we have a single list in the coming election, a popular front. Um, and even then, it was almost like it was like sort of they only won by 100,000 votes. But think about the difference. Had they lost, they'd have started that war without their fingers on the levers of, of, of state power. As it was, they had the police, the army, they had the guns, they had the, they had the presidential palace, which is what, what you want to start the civil war. Um, Spanish, the French Popular Front unleashed and then suppressed the biggest strike wave in the history of a Western country. So it's not nothing. Popular Front, electoral alliances, difficult though they may be, and we can maybe talk about it. Point two, the other thing that worked in the 30s was laws and regulations. Um, yes, in 1930, Cable Street mostly was defeated. In 1937, they, start, they, they tried to march down Green Street in London, which is in South London, in Southwark, and were defeated again. But this time they had no uniforms because the uniforms were banned. A German lawyer called Karl Lowenstein wrote in the 30s a famous article called Militant Democracy, where he argued it's not the job of democracy to facilitate fascism. It's the job of democracy to smash fascism. And to do it, you need to use state power. Now, I believe as someone in the 70s and 80s, I wasn't that keen on state power being used to smash the BMP. I was quite keen on doing it ourselves. I now believe that, that what we're dealing with is something so virulent and so strong. To the state, to, and a great example, it was the capital. Hill insurrection should be stopped. Um, finally, uh, and I hope people are hearing me because I'm seeing my internet connection is unstable as a message. Finally, we need to build and nurture an anti-fascist ethos. What that simply means is that don't be if you buy this or you you know if you know somebody who lends it you or nick it from a bookshop whatever don't do that but you know maybe some people need to just don't be frightened of having this message in public the whole thing that trump did the whole thing that trump tried to do was to stigmatize anti-fascism he indeed tried to to at one point designate Antifa in, in America, which doesn't exist, it's just a network of anti-fascists, as a terrorist organisation. The important thing was, in the 30s, that people were proud to be anti-fascists, and that the anti-fascist ethos was bigger than socialism, bigger than liberalism, and bigger than communism. Those are my three, three things. 
electoral alliances, um, laws and regulations, above all, regulations to force big tech not to promote fascism and to, to nurture and, and, and value the anti-fascist ethos. Now, I'm seeing uh, that a few people have lost me at a certain point, so I'm going to shut up there and hand over to David and see if the connection will stabilise a bit. Thanks, Paul. And, and can I just say um, how much I enjoyed your talk? I'm sure everyone else listening to you covered an enormous amount of ground there. Um, things from history, things from the present. I, I've got two or three sort of semi-prepared questions or kind of themes questions, which I'd like to ask. Um, I'm also, again, to say for everyone listening, I'm looking for people to message me either through the Q&A or through the chat with individual questions. So once I've got through two or three of mine, I'll try and um, bring in some from the floor as well. But but I want to start off, Paul, um, one of the things that, that's in your book, which, which people you didn't quote tonight, but I think it's an absolutely lovely quote, but I wanted to ask you about is you say fascism is the mobilisation of people's fear of freedom after they've seen a glimpse of freedom. And I say when I read that, that seemed an incredibly powerful statement. But but I wondered if you could unpack it a bit tonight. You know, if you think about you're talking about a fascism which has taken on its new and distinctive form in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, for a lot of us in the room, we'd be quite surprised by this idea that we've seen this sudden glimpse of freedom, which hadn't been there before. And if we, if that would terrify them, presumably it would excite us. So okay. what is this fear of freedom that they're okay. responding to? Yeah. Okay. If I freeze again, just to put your hand up and say frozen, and I'll try and just carry on, but you'll only hear the words. I'll open. do that. Yeah. Right. To write this book, I went back and studied in, in quite some detail the two main fascist uh, power grabs. So Mussolini in Italy between 1920 and 1922 and uh, Hitler in Germany, 29 to 33. And we get taught as left activists, you know, the classic Marxist theory of fascism was that fascists are the kind of boot boys of the bourgeoisie, of a section of the bourgeoisie or the whole bourgeoisie, and they need them at the mobile moment when the workers' movement is so strong that the army and the police can't contain them. Then you need to mobilise the mass of the middle class. Actually, that isn't exactly what happened. If you look at, let's take Italy as a micro example. Mussolini is nowhere until November 20, 1920. He, he's lost the election. He's got, he's got, armed squads of ex-soldiers parading around in black shirts, but they're getting nowhere. The peasants, the socialist peasantry, using their socialist trade union, Terra, seized the land, occupied the land, and then, here's the crucial thing, won local elections in something like 8,000 local town councils, tiny local town councils. This was a trigger moment. Now, is this like, does that conform to... Um, the workers are so strong that the, the state can't defeat them. No, not exactly, because those workers weren't an insurrectionary movement. They simply got the land. They controlled the rate of exploitation. At a micro level, they were dictating to individual landowners what they couldn't, couldn't do. And the landowners just said, we can't tolerate this. And here's people who are not supposed to be in charge of the local town council. They don't even wear shoes at work. Here's people who are communists and we're Catholics. And here's people who, you know, who are co communists and socialists and we're devout Catholics who shouldn't be free. And that was the moment where they turned to Mussolini and said, we need fascism. We need your squads to not to be sitting in Milan attacking socialist meetings. We need them on these farms attacking peasants. And within four months, the peasant movement of Emilia Romagna, which is a province in central Italy, was destroyed by the fascists. Now, what's the modern equivalent of that? We haven't got a strong labour movement. No, we haven't got an insurrectionary labour movement in it, we, at all. We haven't seized any farms. But if you look at Me Too, if you look at Black Lives Matter, I would also argue in the book, you look at Gezi Park occupation in 2013 in Turkey, if you look at the 2011 occupation of the squares movements from, you know, Tahrir Square in Egypt through to, to Syntagma and Sol in Syntagma in Greece, Sol in, in Madrid. What you're seeing 
was something more powerful than I think we understand. When, if you think the, the people drawn to fascism are people who fear freedom, <clears throat> don't want others to be free, and are prepared to mobilize to stop people being free, those 2011 movements blossoming later into Black Lives Matter and Me Too, and no Fridays for the Future and Extinction Rebellion, it just triggers something. Now, the two sets of theorists who covered this and understood it, one set who were the Marxist Freudians in the 30s. Now, the communists really didn't like the Marxist Freudians. They kicked them out. You know, they expelled them from the Communist Party. They suppressed their journals. They stopped the work they were trying to do in the German Communist Party. But I think that the Marxist Freudians were right. Um, that the fascism, of course, is an expression of a, a crisis within capitalism. It's also an expression of a deeper thing that, that, that class society creates for human beings, which is the fear of freedom. Um, and so that was one set of people. But amazingly as well, there is another historian who's a reactionary, Ernst Nolter. He's almost seen as the father of fascist studies. But his book, Fascism in Its Era, translated into English as uh, Three Faces of Fascism, written in 1963, comes to do an amazingly similar conclusion to the conclusion of the Marxist Freudians. That is, he called it, it's just fear of, it's practical opposition to transcendence. What that means is practical opposition to the possibility of freedom. And so that's the framework I've tried to introduce. As someone who had worked in the kind of Marxist Orthodox tradition for most of my activism and most of my political life, I found it wasn't enough to explain this thing that we are seeing now. And what better explains it to me is that 2011 through to now has been an amazing demonstration of the possibility of human freedom and the closeness of that objective. And it's triggered a bunch of people who just can't live with it. OK, thank you. The second question I wanted to ask is now, um, I mean, when you gave your presentation, it's very clear. And again, this is very clear in your book that, that you, you see two dynamic forces. You, you talk about fascists and you talk about populists. And um, I'm going to use that phrase in this talk about, you know, some points we thought there was a firewall. And, you know, I mean, you know, it wasn't just the populists who've done this. We're all amongst ourselves. We remember times when left wing parties in government used to play a similar thing of trying to promise some of the things which the fascists would live in to be a barrier. So you say the barrier is broken down. Um, can you talk mo a bit more about the relationship between the fascists and the populists? And I'll, two sides of this, Quest, first side of this. What's in it for the populists? Now, Boris Johnson doesn't look like a fascist. He doesn't wear a Nazi uniform. So why would he want a relationship with them? And sec the second side of this, is there any sense in which that there's there's sort of frictions or tensions in that relationship? And there's only, you know, at times in the past, yeah. fascist reliability to populists, could they become a liability again today? Right. OK, Let, that's, that's a great question. Um, I'll try and not wrap it on for too long, but um, the, the best case study is Trump. Trump and the insurrectionists. So Trump is not a fascist. He didn't have a fascist project. He came to power to enrich himself and to unleash economic nationalism, uh, populist racism, white, white supremacist racism, and of course, misogyny, which are all adjacent to the fascist thing, but don't actually constitute fascism. In power, he radicalized. In power, once he realized that A, fascists liked him, he went out of his way to encourage them. So the Charlottesville 2017 demo, he could have said, you know, uh, he could have said, uh, I want nothing to do with this. Um, my project is, is American capitalism. He didn't. He said, some of them are good people, if you remember. Then, as it became clear he could lose uh, towards the end of 2018, I think it's clear that him and his people took a turn towards encouraging the far-right groups. The far-right groups saw Trump, Trump as, now this is, I point this out in the book, the ideal situation for, for modern fascism isn't to be in power yet, it's to have a person like Trump in power, echoing your messaging, creating a space for you to operate in, and indeed to operate violence, because they they very quickly turned to, to violent uh, insurrectionary activities during the Black Lives Matter demos. So the Black Lives Matter demos of 
the summer of 2020 were then were then met by armed, you know, uniformed far right groups. And Trump did nothing. In fact, all he did was suppress the Black Lives Matter. Trump, I'm certain, believed that he could turn on and off this movement. And a lot of the insider stuff that's still coming out, I mean, remember the court cases, um, insider stuff that's still coming out, suggests that Trump thought that by mobilising this fascist mob and behind them his recently radicalised far-right Republican mob, the, the MAGA crowd, people like Ashley Babbitt, who'd voted uh, Obama and then goes into the Capitol and gets shot. Um, this is the, She's the new poster child of, of, of fascism. She wasn't a fascist, but she was a radical Republican su supporter. So you mobilise them, and what should it do? It should force Pence to annul the election. So you steal the election, you override American democracy. That indeed can't be characterised as fascism, but it's a bloody, virulently horrible form of right-wing populism. The the kind of which you are stretching it to say Farage would achieve. But remember, in the meantime, key members of Trump's administration, Mike Flynn, uh, Steve Bannon, who were indicted and then pardoned, i.e. criminals, um, did indeed move overtly to engage with fascism. Bannon, with the traditionalist uh, philosophers like Dugan and Carvalho, who I write about in the book, Flynn via QAnon, and QAnon became a major accelerator for fascism. So at the moment, look, the th the, my frustration with political science, brilliant though it is, is that it, it's kind of like having a, it's kind of like having a kind of static textbook when you're dealing with something that's, that's just mercurial. And we need to be able to have categories of, of understanding that right-wing populists can indeed evolve now in the direction of being the facilitators and the kind of avatars of real fascism. Whereas, say, in the 90s, when, say, me and you, David, have been engaged with understanding, say, how did the BMP, a fascist group, become a right-wing populist party, going from street marches of nothing to a million votes in 2009? Uh, and, and well, that's a process of evolution from fascism towards a form of right-wing populism. What we never anticipated... I would certainly didn't, was that a form of right-wing populism emerging from the Republican Party, the oldest democratic party in the world, becomes fascist adjacent. So this is what's doing all the political science people's heads in, and what's the reason for it? We can't leave it to academia. Great to have political science, great to have academic history, but the anti-fascist theory of the 30s was written by worker activists, not by historians or academics. And the activists need to own the theory. So that's my kind of summary on that. Okay, lovely. Look, uh, we haven't got that that long. We're already at quarter two, and I think that um, five leads were hoping this event would come in just a bit under an hour overall. Um, but I do still have at least a couple of questions, and, and these these are ones which are um, also coming from the floor now. So, And they're all about um, the popular front that you're talking about as the kind of antidote to this. Yeah. And one question I might take it up actually is because it's put rather well in the chat. So if I can get it here, it was comes from um, Adrian Leibovitz. He says, um, we might need a popular front, but didn't the Corbyn period demonstrate that it's not the left that doesn't want to do this, but the centrists and the liberals? They were the ones that seemed to prefer yeah. right wing populism uh, than left social democracy. And he asked, how can we achieve a popular front under these conditions? And just before I hand over to you, I, mean, I should say that I'd come here today um, planning to ask you almost identically the same question. But the, the evidence I was going to say was look at America and how Bernie Sanders um, was defeated by the DNC. Don't those both point okay, to things in this? Yeah. But, but, you know, I mean, let's not give it. The popular front itself was three things. It was an overt electoral alliance made in public. So 40 odd organizations entered a room in 19, between 1935 36 and signed a governmental declaration that they were going to, a joint manifesto. Now, you know, I, let's come up in a minute to what the obstacles to this are, but that's what it was. It wasn't a secret agreement like that, that clearly happened between. Uh, Biden and uh, 
Sanders. It's clear, clearly some some kind of secret tacit agreement was took place. I'm good that it did, but I Sanders stood down early, if you remember. But the Popular Front was a formal legal agreement. So that's number one. Number two, it was a mass movement. So if you think about a lot of the problems, so those of you in the Labour Party, you can't go to your Labour Party branch at the moment without being, you can't discuss this. We're not having this on the agenda. You know, up yours, you know, uh, from, from the HQ. Well, Popular Front's got around that by creating new formations on the ground, new committees where liberals, socialists and communists could say up yours to their party bureaucracy and just do things on the ground. The, the one that, that worked, the committee that worked, was actually called the Committee of Vigilance of the Intellectuals Against Fascism, which so it's a weird title because a lot of the people in it were, were workers, but it was a good thing to have. It's a little bit like when we had the People's Assemblies when they really worked in the, uh, 10, 15 years ago, when you could cut through party lines. So that's the second thing, an anti-sectarian melting pot at local level that you can create. The third thing is culture. The Popular Front created the greatest cultural revolution in popular culture, mass culture of the 20th century. So, you know, they, from Jean Renoir's movies through to, you know, Edith Piaf's songs, through to Django Reinhardt and Stefan Grappelli in the jazz clubs, through to, you know, magazines, crime novels, Daily life was permeated by the spirit of anti-fascism, rather in a way that I do remember the ANL achieved between seventy-seven and seventy-nine with the with by merging itself with punk rock um, in Britain. No, um, so that's what it was. When I argue for a popular front, that's what I'm arguing for. Not just should Labour, the Lib Dems, make a tacit agreement, but yeah, the issue is, of course. Liberalism, centralism, centrism is at war with the left, not the right. And the argument we need to have with them is don't be at war with us, be at war with the right. Um, I think that argument is increasingly, whether it's winnable, I don't know. But I want to have it because so many of the effectively liberal uh, centrist people I interface with are panicked. They were panicked by Trump. They're pan they'll be if you think of a panic by Trump. Wait till Marine Le Pen gets into the second, um, in the, into the final round of the French presidential election. Then they'll be panicked. Uh, so I think what I would say to, to left wing people who like me have seen neoliberal austerity as the main problem. It, it was you know they smashed Greece, they destroyed the NHS, etc. Now the main problem is something bigger. I I, I think that's it. No. How to persuade them is that we need to mobilize. They have masses, as they say, we, the left, have masses. We need to persuade our masses to sort of not be sectarian, but they have masses as well. And I think that, you know, I mean, it, 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 it ranges from the pathetically parochial, like having a secret um, spreadsheet uh, in, a, in a, I think it was East Sussex, the Labour, the Lib Dems, and the Greens had a secret spreadsheet agreement not to campaign against each other and took about a third of the Tory seats in a Tory stronghold in the British local elections, right through to what will ha have to happen in, in April 2022. If it's Macron versus Marine Le Pen, then with a sad and heavy heart, I'm going to vote Macron. And I'm going to tell my French comrades to vote Macron, even though he's an Islamophobe and has, has, has attacked the working class left, right and centre. What you want is to try and be in advance of that, to try and claim some ownership and say, you know, all right, Macron, you do your thing. Actually, Macron's got no party. La, La, La République en Marche is not a party. It's got no roots. It's got no masses. You could create some masses for a bigger thing. And I think, indeed, for all the slight, well, Mel well let's not go into Mélenchon, the problems with Mélenchon, but Mélenchon's rhetoric is actually quite popular frontist. Melchior's rhetoric is about the republic and about the people. And I have no problem with that. I think a left populism that, that reaches out beyond pure economic leftism to a defense of democracy and the republican values in France is what we're going to need. But in the end, if Macron, if sorry, if, if Mélenchon doesn't get into the last round, he should call for his followers to vote Macron. 
which he didn't, or he was very reluctant to last time. So that's the, the practical import of what I'm saying is at the moment that. Uh, two last questions, and they're both about the kind of boundaries of that alliance. So one person from the floor has, has been asking, um, get it up. Are there any Conservative Party MPs that are concerned with fascism or might be willing to form political alliances aimed at countering fascist trends? Well, they're few. And the problem with, with, I think I could say that there are some, actually, but unfortunately, they are, they're not particularly liberal conservatives. They're, they're conservatives who I would say are quite nationalist and who see the far right threat very much through the lens of Russian interference or Chinese interference into British politics. So if you think about all the MPs who are leading on Cold Warrior stuff against China, uh, Tom Tugendhat, Tobias Elwood, Neil O'Brien, um, they are not liberal conservatives, but what they are, they, they see the threat to democracy as a threat to national security. Actually, that, you know, Johnson thinks he's like the, the latter day Winston Churchill. Their politics are closer to Churchill's politics than Johnson is. Um, yeah. And I, I actually have interfaced with all three of them. I, you know, you wouldn't never trust a Tory. What I would say is, when you see a, a Tory MP like Neil O'Brien, uh, who I think represents an East Midlands constituency, isn't it? Obi, I can't remember. But Neil O'Brien goes out of his way to engage and debunk QAnon stuff, far right, far right QAnon mythologies. And I think that's you, uh, what you would at least say is that there's someone who understands what they're up against. Um, but look, the, the Tories are going to be a minimal part of this. The important thing is th this. When I use the word liberal with a small l, I'm describing the majority of green voters, all liberal voters, and, and I'm afraid to say large numbers of Labour voters and activists, because the great un- spoken secret of Labourism is it's not just that people like Keir Starmer think like a classic liberal. It's like so Starmer thinks. He's a, he's a left-wing liberal, uh, philosophically, whether he knows it or not. Um, it's not just that, that Starmer is a kind of son of, um, of, uh, of kind of, you know, atly liberalism, that large numbers of working class people are actually liberal. In, they're not class against class socialists. If, if you if you uh, if you talk to and interrogate, you know, the average Labour voting public sector worker, their 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 political philosophy is small l liberalism. So you have to deal with that. We'll live with that. Um, I think the huge opportunity for the left is that it can identify the danger, just as it did in eventually after after ten years of idiocy and ridiculous sectarianism, it identified the danger. It made huge compromises. So the French Communist Party didn't just sing the national anthem, didn't just sing the Marseillaise and fly the, tr the tricolor, which it had, it had refused to do, didn't just vote for the military spending budget of the government. It actually abandoned its uh, support for, for colonial liberation struggles in the French colonies as a part of, of the Popular Front. Now, I'm not advocating that, but you can see that the, de the, the depths to which it had to go. What did it get in return? It got leadership of a mass strike movement of 10 million people that nearly brought, that only didn't bring down French capitalism because the Communist Party decided it shouldn't. We will, I think, as the danger arises, so the final point is, Trump has not gone. 18 American states are, have passed laws that suppress democratic voting. That those 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 laws will be upheld by the Supreme Court, which is stuffed full of Trump appointees. By 2022, we were looking at a zombie Congress. By 2024, we're looking at the real danger of Trump returning or somebody worse than Trump. And you see, American democracy just walked away from Afghanistan. You know, I never supported the Afghan war, but look at people who did. The liberal sort of center in American British politics is going, what the hell has we unleashed? We've now got a strategic defeat of, of America in war, thanks to this guy being in power. If you put him in power again, he'll hand more um, of American democracy and Americans' kind of global legacy over to its opponents. And I think it, the penny's finally starting to drop and we can win an argument with them. What's the argument that we want to win with, with them? 
radical action on climate change, radical action on social justice, are the modern equivalents of the New Deal. And remember, Roosevelt was a liberal. Um, that's the kind of ally we're going to have to have because the danger is great. That's the, the, the point of the book is that danger is not negligible. It's a big danger. Well, listen, Paul, um, I do want to ask just one, one last question. And, and, but I, I, think it, 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 it's in, I think it's one which fits within everything you've been saying because you've been talking about the popular front as an alliance, particularly an alliance of left-wing parties. But there are some people who've been um, joining the conversation and been sending questions from the chat who come from, for example, XR and who come from the environmental tradition yeah. and who aren't necessarily attached to political parties in that way because, of course, many fewer people these days have that relationship to parties that people had in the 30s. So, again, could you talk a bit about how people like that, how they could contribute to shaping and making this sort of um, political alliance you're talking about? OK, we could have a whole meeting about the convergence between the, the, the environmental and the climate agenda and far right versus democracy. Um, first thing to say is the catastrophe that the fascists want is increasingly framed around climate. So the populist right are, are by and large climate deniers. They've taken millions of, of, of dollars from the fossil fuel industry to deny climate at change. Trump is an example. Swedish Democrats, the Sweden Democrats are a great example. The True Finns party, another populist right wing party, you know, they claim that wind turbines are a threat to the Finnish way of life. Um, the fascists have always, in general, been ecologists. You know, the, the weirdest thing is that the first ecologist, Ernst Haeckel, was also a, a radical right wing, uh, you know, early, you know, pre fascist uh, race supremacist. And there are, there is no eco fascism, which is, which, you know, which says save the planet, not human beings, which says, only maybe a billion human beings deserve to survive, and those are the white European human beings, and the other six billion human beings don't deserve to survive. In fact, Penti Linkola, the late Finnish ecofascist, once said, who misses six million Jews uh, from the Holocaust? You know, the planet doesn't. So, right, there is an ecofascism. There is equally an eco-socialism, which says we are going to use the fact that we need to mitigate climate change in, through radical decarbonization to transform and indeed eradicate this 250 year old system called carbon capitalism. Um, I personally don't believe we can decarbonize without significantly undermining capitalism. Those are the stakes in that, in that argument. What would I say to somebody who's saying, I know many XR activists, what would I say to them? I don't say to them, join my party, you know, because you may find parties boring. What you are doing is a course of action designed to change parties, uh, behaviour and legislation and to alert people and good luck to you. But what I would say is that, like I say to all grassroots, bottom up networked activists, at some point, if the action that you take triggers the desired result, somebody somewhere in a suit will take a decision. And what the world I want to exist in is the world in which I can influence that person in the suit directly. In fact, I might have to be the person in the suit because the decision will, the decision will be a better decision if it's taken by somebody who is politically engaged with the system. Um, and so what we need above all to stop is the right stroke far right alliance destroying democracy before we can get our hands on it. I think that's one of the key reasons why they're doing it. They cannot see, that they lament the end of the carbon age. They don't want to give up the lifestyle. Think about the AFD in Germany, its main campaign slogan is save diesel. Save diesel is their slogan. What they mean is save our lifestyle. We are going to have to defeat them. The ones we can't persuade, we're going to have to defeat them. And defeat means power. And I, I think that's what, um, you know, I don't think XR and anarchism are the same thing, but I think they may play analogous roles. In Spain in 1936, the anarchism was strong and the anarchist instinct was to say, fuck politics, you know, 
leave it to leave it to the communists, leave it to the liberals. In the end, anarchists voted for the first time ever for the Popular Front, and that was another of its achievements. So an achievement of the kind of alliance I want to create would be one where you felt that you had some ownership and control of it from below to the point where you felt enthusiastic to vote for it. We tried with Corbyn one route, which was a classic left social democratic route through the Labour Party. We saw what happened. The entire establishment just mobilised to crush us, to stigmatise us. We tried that. It's not going to happen again. It won't happen again through the Labour Party. They've got control back and lots of people are so fed up they've left. But what's the great lesson of all our lives, mine, yours, Dave, and everybody listening to this, you, nobody in power can ignore a mass movement. You never can. Well, should we leave it there? Um, we're past eight o'clock. Um, I'm sure I could quite happily have carried on asking questions for another hour. Certainly had lots more people from the floor and I'd like to apologise to everyone who I didn't get to read out their question. But listen, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks, Paul, for his contribution. Yeah. And um, I hope that um, next time we all get to meet, uh, maybe it's in person and maybe it's on the on the barricades, on the rendezvous of victory, as people used to say. But anyway, thanks again, Paul. At this point, normally I'd be saying to everyone, please show your appreciation in the usual manner. Of course, we can't do that on Zoom, um, but I'll end, get, I'll end it there. And thanks, everyone, for coming. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, David.